Well, distinguished chairman, thank you for the kind words. And at the outset, I'd like to congratulate uh, Dr. Anjana, a chip of the old block. She is uh, Professor Mohan's daughter, as some of you might know. And uh, her impassioned presentation on a topic so dear to us all, the prevention of diabetes, <coughs> has important aspects. Now, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, <coughs> it's quite clear to us that uh, that's where I come from, of course. That's Agra with the Taj. And the creator of the Taj is, I think, the scientific benefactor to many studies in Agra because he invites scientists and clinicians from all over the world. And uh, that's my institution, the third oldest medical college in the country. Now, it is clear that the burden of diabetes is so great that prevention is the, o is the only way forward to a very, very large extent. And it is also clear today that one of the major mantras of prevention is lifestyle management. Now, it is believed to be the key to not only uh, longevity, not only to health, but the prevention of overweight, diabetes, cancer, and the various manifestations of the metabolic syndrome. Now, metabolic diseases are rising in the country, including notably diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And uh, I submit with evidence that this is an interplay of not only altered lifestyle, but also environmental degradation. People blame our genes. The genes in the Indian population have not altered over the last 50 years. They have the same genetic pool. People blame urbanization and motorization. Yet, the number of cars, even in an urban Indian family, is much less than in the United States. And yet, our diabetes rates are rising and the US rates are falling. That's really food for thought that it is not merely urbanization. And as Anjana just now showed you elegantly, the rural population is no stranger to diabetes. My submission is that it is environmental degradation which is causing the explosion of diabetes in our country. We know the evidence of, which is often put forward before us of McDonaldization, poisonous drinks, not only for the pesticides, but also for the soda, and more especially for the sugar content. We know that the girth of the nation is increasing. We know that we are increasingly affected by stress. The 21st century has brought an increase of stress and not a decrease of it. And we know that Indians are sleeping less. All these are factors we know that aggravate the uh, genesis of the metabolic syndrome. And we also know of the increasing clout of the tobacco makers, which you have noticed in the press only a few days ago. We know that the cigarette is a loaded gun. And we know that in India, tobacco is the captain of the men of death, not only because of smoking, but also because of other forms of tobacco unique to India, chewing, dent, dant manjan, dentifrices, snuff, and tobacco surrogates, such as pan masala, and gutkas, and flavored arika nuts, which contain tobacco or even worse congeners. And we also know the environmental stresses. And these I am going to call your attention to. One is pollution. The second is pesticides and plastics. Endocrine disrupting chemicals. Persistent organic pollutants. Volatile organic chemicals. And unhealthy food additives in processed foods. They have all been incriminated and well documented to raise the liver GGT, to raise the frequency of fatty liver, even in people who are not diabetic, even in pre-diabetics, even in people from diabetic families, and of course radiation, there's solar radiation, there's ultraviolet tanning, there's x-rays, there's microwaves, all are believed to contribute as environmental stressors. Now, 
is it fair to blame the growth uh, or the growth economy for this? I would call your attention to the fact that what as students of human medicine we know, there are two types of growth. One is unbridled, unplanned growth analogous to cancer. The second is a controlled and planned growth analogous to the child evolving to adulthood. And there are lots of historical examples about this. During the 18th century, industrial revolution occurred in England and that led to slums and penury as described in the novels of Dickens such as Oliver Twist and many others of the same genre. Today's examples of unhealthy growth, I'll just mention two, are the industry of ship breaking and also the prevalence of rural textile dyeing contaminating even the subterranean water and villagers gleefully drinking their water because they're unaware of the dyes in the drinking water. And you have to see this in the many villages in our own country. On the contrary, we can think of healthy growth, unlike the industrial revolution growth of England in the 18th century. And one example is Scandinavia, other examples are Costa Rica, another example may well be Bhutan. And here, we are talking of a green economy with well thought out pollution prevention and health promoting measures such as parks, natural lighting, solar energy and libraries which promote a knowledge economy and allow a functional welfare state. Now, what are the keys to health and longevity from the point of view of prevention? We all are agreed on the following. You need healthy food to eat. And what is healthy food? Anjana just defined for you. You need health promoting playgrounds for physical activity. It's a very sad fact that only 20% of schools in India have adequate playgrounds. This is well documented. Only 20%. 80% of schools in India do not even have playgrounds. What do we talk about promoting physical activity? We need healthy air to breathe, free from pollution. We need a de-stressed environment and very, very important, I think, is we need the prevention of chemical and microbiological threats which are jeopardizing human health, such as endocrine disruptors, viruses, bacteria such as H. pylori and others. If you go to any of the major towns of this country, you will find piles of views. One of my major worries whenever visitors come from abroad to see the Taj, is that they do not also see the piles of junk and refuse littering. It is a real worry that on the one hand they are seeing the Taj, on the one hand they are seeing my medical school, on the other hand they are also seeing the junk and the, and the refuse piled on the streets. Now, from precept to practice, these are well thought. How do we achieve a change in this? I think the keys to achievement are, number one, rational rules and regulation, achievable and not utopian. Don't prescribe standards which are not achievable. Number two, it's very important to have what I call technology-enabled monitoring. Anjana just gave you an example of technology-enabled therapeutic intervention. I'm talking of prevention. Monitoring, you can monitor the air quality, the water quality, and the soil quality. And only in two days ago in the newspaper, they said they're now going to have an air quality index for at least 10 uh, urban cities in, in this country. We need entities like closed circuit television, where veritable Brick Brothers analogous to 1984, where the pollution is physically monitored. And we need the Internet of Things where things themselves telemetrically communicate to the monitors what is happening. We just had the death of Lee Kuan Yee, the Singapore uh, elder statesman who, was, who led Singapore into the 21st century. And I'd like to mention that one of the things he did was that in any of the toilets, if a person forgot to flush, it was, it was monitored and he was fined. The very fact, so that sort of thing, that 
we need monitoring to enable technology. Why is it that we allow pollution to occur? Why is it that we contribute to pollution? So we need honest, well-paid, well-equipped workers and enforcers against pollution. Now, how do we achieve this? We have to change mindsets. The same NRI who abroad will never drop a thing outside his car. In India, merrily does it. Why is it? Because mindsets have not changed. We need universal literacy. I think the first step to uh, uh, mindset changing is universal literacy. And we can achieve it by satellite adult education and by a network of libraries. Maybe every post office can be also a library. And at least every population of 50,000 should have a library unit to promote both printed and electronic information. We need well-researched biological alternatives to short-term chemical pollutants and pesticides. We need mechanized solid waste collection and incineration. We need biotreated liquid effluents to save our rivers. We need to popularize healthy lifestyle. We need adequate playgrounds for schools. I mentioned only 20% have them. We need intensive education. Now, we tried this in Project Marg along with Dr. Anup Mishra and <coughs> Dr. Mehta of Jaipur in three towns, uh, Delhi, Agra, and Jaipur. And we tried for a three-prong prevention. Children, the future citizens, using teacher heroines, popular doctors, local athletic heroes, and the parents in PTA meetings were indoctrinated. Also, we need to indoctrinate the opinion leaders media personalities, ex-servicemen, electronic and print media, and even religious leaders to get the, them on our side. And we need to aim at the high-risk groups. Like in Agra, we are aiming at what's called the Agra Preventive Intervention Diabetic Study, where children of bi-diabetic couples uh, who are already afflicted with Ravan syndrome, as you have written them, the metabolic syndrome, because of its multi-headedness. And we did it by debate competitions, by lectures, by collage competitions, by quizzes, by health quizzes, by tiffin competitions. We did all that. Over a period of three years, we visited 20 schools, 10 visits to each school, and covered 20,000 children. We delivered a powerful message to the children, which is strengthened by their role models, the teachers. And children recognized tobacco as evil, and come and tell their parents, we do not want chini ka paratha. Agra was commended by the Diabetes Federation of India, the World Diabetes Federation, and the MARG was mentioned in the World Health Literature. But this required, this effort over two or three years required resources. Resources are the crunch. Healthy food, fruits, nuts, and vegetables are expensive. Potato is cheaper. We need physical education games. We need areas for them. We need nutritional supplementation with healthy foods in a corruption-free system. Corruption is a canker that eats into our progress. We need clean drinking water. Sixty years after independence, we still don't have clean drinking water available. We need honest law enforcement. And we need to inculcate health-promoting and de-stressing ideals. In order to get these playgrounds, we need a rich economy. We need to find resources. And a rich economy can only come from growth. A rich economy is essential for primary prevention, for the secondary limitation, and the tertiary prevention of diabetes and its complications. It is equally needed for funding research into unsolved problems, such as why are some children fat despite dieting and physical activity? It is not merely a matter of lifestyle modification. Only 55% diabetics are prevented from diabetes by lifestyle modification. 45% still progress to diabetes. Why is that so? We need research for this. And research, again, needs commitment of funds. A rich economy is achievable by green growth. We have these examples of a fat child, fat parents, and we really don't know how to correct the obesity. It is not simply prescribing exercise. So we need clean avenues to growth. And I'll give you some shining examples of a clean avenue to a growth economy. Software information technology, we are exporting our services throughout the world and earning money for the country. 
in management, our IIMs and our IITs are now world recognized centers and the people who are coming out from them are contributing to the Indian economy. We are already exporting medicines to the world thanks to our brilliant uh, pharmaceutical industry and I contemplate that very soon chemo drugs will diversify to biologicals such as antibodies and peptides and India and perhaps China will export these to the whole world and they will constitute one third of the market. We are, our space technology, we are not only really launching on satellites, we are renting our satellites and we are renting space. Medical tourism, exporting fruits, Goargam and Ishabdola, one of our top exports, Himalayan medicinals, these are all avenues for green growth. In conclusion, I would like to submit that improved sanitation, clean energy, high-speed roads. You mentioned, you, Ranjana mentioned how difficult it was to get to the villages. State of the art of hospitals for, for intelligent and rational treatment. Schools with large and attractive playgrounds. Intelligent law enforcement. Paid policemen who will not take a bribe to go away. Immunization campaigns all involve the provision of resources. It is submitted that the growing economy will provide the wherewithal to fund these. The growing economy, if leavened by the wisdom of planners, will itself do away with the expansion of slums and pollution and thus help all of us who seek to stem the diabetes explosion. It needs courage, it needs hard work and it needs a population to be vocal. And that's why I stress universal literacy. Emerson said, let us hitch our wagon to a star. We must dare to dream of a healthy India, of a healthy subcontinent. And we must remember the Upanishadic exhortation translated by Swami Vivekananda over 100 years ago, awake, arise and stop not until the goal is reached. Thank you.